All right, so chapter three. We're going to look at these uh, learning objectives. We're going to talk about judicial review, talk about jurisdiction, we're going to get into the trial process and appellate process, and also look at discovery. And then finally, we're going to look at um, alternative dispute resolution. How much do you think attorneys charge an hour? <laughs> Too much. I don't think that's possible, but anyway. What? Give me. What? 85 what? You know an attorney that charges $85 an hour? They say you get what you pay for. Um, I, do a lot of, I do a lot of stuff on a flat fee, well, kind of flat fee basis, but like estate planning, real estate, I'll say this is what it's going to cost for a trust. So what it's going to cost for your real estate closing. So I don't do so much fee basis now, but when I was, it, well, I was between $150 and $200, and that was a few years ago. So $300 an hour is not too uncommon these days. If you went around and looked in Grand Rapids, that would be a fairly um, common rate. So uh, $300 an hour, takes me a couple hours to do a complaint, takes me... Uh, like me half a day to do a motion. Like let's say, how many day trial would we have? So why are you teaching school? Yeah, well, money isn't important to me. So uh, <laughs> it actually is a lot less stressful. I mean, I just hook up a mic and just start sitting here and talk. That's all I have to do. Um, so how many day trial? Let's say three day trial. Eight hours a day, three days, 24 hours times $300 an hour. What's that? $7,200? Right. So start adding this up. All right. Now, uh, you know, we, we've left out all the discovery process. We've left out selecting a jury, which could take another half day. We've left out every time the trial gets adjourned or the motion gets rescheduled, and i got to go sit there for you and charge you to sit there. Uh, and then the case is decided, you're not happy, you appeal, and we start all over again. So, given all that, I don't know, we're at a grand total of about $15,000 right now before we even get into the appeal. So we might look at some alternative ways to resolve disputes. Because okay. it's expensive, a lot of time taken away from work, um, and it really can be kind of a headache. When people come to see me and talk to me about an issue they have a dispute about, litigation is not the first thing that we talk about. So we're going to back up, though, a little bit here and talk about the role of the courts. Okay. How many of you got at least far enough in your chapter to hit judicial review? Okay, now it's like the first thing in the <laughs> chapter. So, um, What was judicial review? Because up here it says... Judicial review came from a Supreme Court case, Marbury versus Madison, which was a couple pages in your chapter. I don't expect you to remember the name of the case or the year the, the case was decided, but I do want you to understand what judicial review is. So what is it? It's the way of kind of using the Constitution to at least every once in a while say no to the most. Uh, close. It, the Constitution gives the courts the authority to take a look at the other branches of government, the laws that they pass, the actions they take, and determine whether they're constitutional or not. That's what the Supreme Court said. The Supreme Court said, in order to ensure we have this balance of power, we have to be able to look at the actions of the other branches of government and determine whether they're constitutional or not. Okay? We don't just interpret our own law in a corner here. We actually look at the other branches of government. Okay? So, one of the first terms we come on is uh, jurisdiction. And when you're on TV, or you're on TV, you're not on TV that often, but you're watching TV, you're watching cops, some cops beating some guy over the head or something, you know, they use the term jurisdiction. What are they usually talking about? No, they're not. Not on TV. That's what it means, but that's not what they're talking about. Right. Often, you know, on cops, they're talking about, oh, they pursued them too far or something. It has to do with the geographic area. But that is not what it means in this chapter and in the law, okay? 
in this chapter, jurisdiction has to do with the power of the court. Now, I'm not saying there aren't issues of jurisdiction in police officers, but I'm saying as far as this chapter is concerned, jurisdiction is what it says up there. The power of the court to hear a particular kind of case. Now, I don't know. I had one brother. When I was young and I didn't want to hear what my brother had to say, I used to cover my ears and go, blah, 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 blah. You can't, I can't hear you. Okay? That's kind of what a judge would be doing if you went into the wrong court and started complaining about something. I uh, can't hear you, can't help you, have no power, get out of here, right? For example, you go, your, your uh, budget's a little tight, can't make ends meet, you want to declare bankruptcy. So you go downtown to one of the courts and say, I want to declare bankruptcy. Well, which court do you have to be in, according to your chapter? A court of limited jurisdiction, is it in the federal or the state court system? Good guess? No, federal, right? So the bankruptcy court is in the bankruptcy division of the U.S. District Court. That's the only place you can go and petition for bankruptcy. So if you go to any of these other courts downtown and say, I'm broke, I need to bankrupt, they like, I can't hear you. Can't help you, got no power. In fact, even if they listen to your story, at the end, they could go, you know what? You're the saddest, um, brokest, that's a word, person I've ever met. I declare you bankrupt. It wouldn't matter, right? Because they have no power to do it, right? So jurisdiction has to do with the power to hear a case and speak the law. All right, in order to get jurisdiction, we've got to have two components. Jurisdiction over the person and jurisdiction over the subject matter, right? To get jurisdiction over the person, we got to let them know that there's some kind of lawsuit or criminal action being taken against them. What was that called in the last chapter, where you let someone know that something's going to happen? <laughs> due process. So jurisdiction over the person is all about due process. Letting that person know, hey, you, the court wants to do something. Okay? So generally, Michigan courts have jurisdiction over the people within Michigan. Does that make sense? Right? If they're within the geographic boundaries of Michigan, Michigan courts can decide cases about them. Just have to let them know. However, not everybody that you want to sue is in Michigan. I mean, think about it. We were talking about interstate commerce and where we get products these days. Isn't there a good chance that we might be injured or the product might be defective, but it's not someone who's within the state of Michigan, the seller isn't? It's, it's pretty common, right? So, there are these long-arm statutes. Anybody ever heard of the long arm of the law? Kind of reaching out and touching someone. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And what do you need in order for a court to get jurisdiction over you if you're not within the state. Minimum contacts, which is what? In business law, it means doing business within the state. Right? And um, there's lots of things that could count towards doing business. <laughs> having uh, sales representatives, having a franchise here, um, talk about the internet a little bit. So there's lots of ways that a corporation or an individual could have minimum contacts with a state, even though they're not within the state. The court could also have jurisdiction over the property. Even if the person's not within the state, if the property is located here, then the court can get jurisdiction over it. So someone might have some real estate here, some personal property here, even though they're not here, the court could seize it uh, if they do it properly. We talked about that. This jurisdiction is called in rem jurisdiction, which means over the property. So if you see that term, that's what it means, property, jurisdiction. Too fast, too slow? Still writing? Okay. Okay. I'll go slower. Talk like 
it? Yes, it is. Um, I probably should have put it out there a little sooner so you could print it out before class, but you still can go out there and get it if you don't want to write all this down. So, NREM jurisdiction is property jurisdiction. You also need jurisdiction over the subject matter, and we already gave you an example of this, bankruptcy. Okay. So even though the court has given you notice, they also have to be the right court for you to come to. You don't go to a criminal court for a family matter, and vice versa. In most cases, the subject matter jurisdiction is determined by statute. And where did statutory law come from? <laughs> Which comes from the legislature, right? Both, so both the uh, federal or state statutes can say, this is the court that deals in those kind of matters. Makes it much more efficient. And some courts are general jurisdiction courts. In other words, they handle a lot of different types of cases. Others are limited. What was an example of limited jurisdiction that I gave you? Bankruptcy. That's all that court does, is bankruptcy. If you think this class is exciting, go to bankruptcy court and sit all day. All right. Original and appellate jurisdiction. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I don't know how much it really helps to write everything down that's up there. Okay. Um, maybe just some key points off of it. I don't know. Whatever works for you. All right. Original and appellate jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction is where the trial happens at. So, in Michigan, a lot of trials start in the district court, which is a little confusing because the federal trial court is also called the district court. So, there's a U.S. district court for federal cases, and then there's Michigan district courts for state trial cases. Not every case starts in the district court, but a lot of them do, which is different from trial, I mean, from appellate jurisdiction. Appellate jurisdiction, the name kind of implies what they do. All right, that's all they do is hear appeals. Okay, which, how are appeals different than trials? How are they different? Yes, right? I mean, if you went down to appellate court and uh, looked around, you wouldn't see uh, witness stands, you wouldn't see jury boxes, you wouldn't see uh, people introducing knives into evidence, you wouldn't see witnesses taking the stand and getting cross-examined, you would see none of that stuff. That's all trial court. Okay? So what is it that appellate courts look at? Right. They go back and look at the record from the lower court. Whatever the judge's decision or the jury's decision, they get a manuscript or record of that and they take a look at it. Okay? They also will get briefs from the attorneys who come and make oral arguments, but it's not the place where the case is retried. Some courts have both original and appellate jurisdiction. For example, the United States Supreme Court has both original and appellate jurisdiction. So don't let that confuse you. Where in the chapter does it talk about the U.S. Supreme Court? Look on page 85. In the last paragraph under the United States Supreme Court, you see where it says, although the Supreme Court has original or trial jurisdiction in rare cases, okay, so you would have to look at the Constitution to see what those cases are. Most of the work is appellate work. 
How does a case get to the United States Supreme Court on appeal? What's that document called that gets it there? A writ of certiorari. Yep. Which means, please hear my case. Not, not actually, but that's what it means. So, uh, lots of cases are um, considered by the Supreme Court, but a small percentage of them are actually heard by the Supreme Court. Okay? You know, on TV they always go, I'm taking this thing all the way to the Supreme Court, right? Well, now you see that's not the case because not every case is entitled to get to the Supreme Court. If it's not a trial in the Supreme Court, which again is very rare, then it has to go through this process to possibly get there. Yeah. Look at Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution, which is back in Appendix A. Section 2, and actually it's like the second paragraph down. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, and those in which a state shall be a party, a Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In every other case, the Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction. Um, so almost every case comes through the appellate court process and if it's purely a state issue, this is important for you to know, if it's purely state, the Supreme Court does not review it. Okay, so think about it. You know, someone goes through the state court system and it has nothing to do with the U.S. Constitution or a federal question, then the Supreme Court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear it because it's purely a state issue. The only time it crosses over from the state court system to the federal one is when. How might a case that was in the state court system end up in the U.S. Supreme Court? Right, because there's both, remember we talked about last time, there's both the Michigan Constitution and the United States Constitution, and you could have a claim that governments, both federal and state level, are violating your constitutional rights. It's in violation of both the Michigan Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. Could involve some important federal issue. It could be a conflict between circuits. Sometimes different courts decide things different ways, and now the Supreme Court has to reach a decision. Supposedly, only the really important cases make it to the Supreme Court. Like I may have mentioned in here before, Bush versus Gore. Remember that dispute? That made it Supreme Court, even though it probably shouldn't have. That would actually seem like it was a state issue, but the Supreme Court felt it was important enough to intervene and decide. And in fact, right now, there is a lot of um, discussion about who is going to be on the Supreme Court. If you look on, what page is the picture of the justices that are on the Supreme Court? 87. Right. There, there's not that many of them. They're getting older. Some of them who are in that picture aren't there anymore because they died or retired. Okay. So we had one person come on the bench. Another one is being considered for position on the Supreme Court. And it's a really big deal right? because the makeup of this body could influence our law in the future. Question? All right, so we talked a little bit about states having jurisdiction over their citizens and reaching out with uh, long arm statutes. Now let's talk about how federal courts get jurisdiction. We already mentioned one about three times. If it involves bankruptcy or something the statute says is purely a federal matter, 
then the federal courts have jurisdiction. In fact, there's a diagram in your chapter. on page 79 that says federal courts have exclusive jurisdiction over federal crimes, antitrust law, bankruptcy, patents, copyrights, trademarks, suits against the United States, and some areas of admiralty law, okay, and other areas too. So if it falls under those categories, they go to federal court right away. On the other side of that chart, there are some cases which are purely state, subject to state jurisdiction, and that would be anything that is not given expressly to the federal courts. In the middle is what we're talking about on this slide. Okay. There are sometimes situations where federal or state courts could have jurisdiction. That's called concurrent jurisdiction. See in the middle of the diagram on page 79, if it's a question of diversity of citizenship, it could be in a state or it could be in the federal courts. So what do you need to have diversity of citizenship? It's on the opposite page, page 78. Right, you need diversity first of all. And it gives you three types of diversity there in the left-hand column. Right. Citizens of different states, a foreign country and a citizen of a different state, or number three, citizens of a state and citizens or subjects of a foreign country. Okay. So you need diversity within the parties. You also need a lot of money, not just to try the case, but the amount in controversy has to be in excess of $75,000. They don't want to nickel and dime this. They don't want everything. So. You need both $75,000 and parties are not from the same state. All right, so exclusive versus concurrent is another way of looking at jurisdiction. And uh, I often hear this when I'm uh, sitting in my office and there's a young in love couple out in the hallway. Um, he'll, she'll say, I want an exclusive dating relationship and he'll say, I would rather a concurrent type dating relationship, okay? Uh, exclusive meaning only one, concurrent meaning more than one at the same time. It may not be the case that all men are like that, or that it's not the other way around, but that's my observation. So, uh, as it applies to the law, more than one court could hear the case at the same time. For example, I am a Michigan resident, I'm outside the state, I get into the accident with somebody from a different state. Doesn't it seem like there might be some question as to which court we would end up going to? Right. So we may end up in a federal court instead of one or the other of those state courts, or we may end up in a state court if the amount isn't enough to get us there. Okay. So there are rules, not that you need to understand any of the rules, that say this is where the case should go. but you should understand exclusive one court, concurrent, more than one court at the same time, could hear the case. All right, another way of looking at jurisdiction is what it looks like on the internet. Because we've talked a whole lot about geographic boundaries and there are not any boundaries on the internet. So when we think we're buying a book from somewhere, what was it? Half? What was it? Half what? Half dot com? Uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows where we're buying that book from or where the server's at or where the customers are at? So it's very difficult to say uh, where the parties are at, uh, where the business is actually being conducted. And the really tricky part is once you start doing business on the internet, you open yourself up to jurisdiction to multiple states, okay? which is much different than open up a mom and pop shop down the street, just dealing locally with local people. There's not so much of a question because they come to you. Right? They come up with a sliding scale. 
On one end is a passive website. We sell shoes. Picture of a shoe. That's it. No way to buy them. Not, not uh, reaching out and trying to solicit business. Just a passive website. In those cases, the courts have said that's not enough to confer jurisdiction on all the states that could see that website. On the other end is e-commerce. If you put a site out there and you open it up for anybody anywhere to purchase from your site, you've just opened yourself up to jurisdiction to anybody from any state that buys from that site. And it's not just states, right? I mean, you could be dealing with international business or clients. Anybody ever purchased or sold anything on eBay? Yeah? Like what? Cell phone. Cell phone. Okay. Where'd you get it from? I mean, you, you purchased it. Was it from another state? Uh, right. Uh, sometimes you don't even track that. Um, it doesn't become so much an issue until there's a dispute, right? Then it's, uh, I didn't get my cell phone, or I didn't get what you sold me. I got it, but it wasn't what you advertised to be. Disputes come up. Well, you know, this is uh, one reason why sometimes people don't sell internationally because they don't want to deal with the international end of things. And the other thing is, is eBay is out of it, right? They make sure that when you join and you do business that you understand if there's a dispute, you're going to go dispute it with someone else. They're not going to resolve it. Okay? I don't know if you've experienced it. They, they help. But they won't resolve it for you. Right? They won't give you your money back. Some, some of it's some, yeah, sometimes they do that. But that, again, is an agreement that you reach to do that kind of stuff. So um, just something to be careful about when you're dealing on the Internet. All right, venue, different issue. Not the same as jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is power. Venue is location. Okay. The most appropriate, convenient place to have the trial. Now, when you, you've heard that word venue before. Concert. Yeah, a concert, yes. The, the, the geographic location where a concert takes place, often referred to as a venue. When else have you heard that? Venue. Have you ever heard of a motion to change venue for some reason? It's always in the news. Someone's claiming that they're not going to be treated fairly by the geographic area that they're in, where they're having their trial. So they want to move somewhere else. Like who claimed that? Scott Peterson. Oh, I hacked up my wife and kid. I don't think people are going to like me. Yeah. Uh, where else? Like almost every major case. What was the case they used in your book? This was further along in your reading. <laughs> I thought I remembered reading something about it. Then you. There's example 3.5 on page 82. Yes, yes. So. Um, I always get these two yahoos mixed up here. Um, Timothy McVeigh, dead, right? I get it right? Um, Timothy McVeigh was executed? Yeah. yeah, okay. Terry Nichols, Michigan boy. Got life, right? Um, they asked for a change of venue. Why? When, there, when both of those cases were going on, they asked for change of venue. Again, federal building blown up, lots of people dead, didn't think that, you know, people would like them too much, right? Recently, Terry Nichols asked for a change of venue again. Why would he do that? Since venue has to do with the most appropriate location for a trial, and if you look at this, it says Nichols was sentenced to life imprisonment. His trial is over, he's been sentenced, he's sitting in prison for life. So why is he asking for... A change in venue now. Do you just forget? What? Different case. They're trying him again. Right? So the first time they, uh, and this, this has a lot to do with jurisdiction. Um, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols prosecuted federal court 
for killing federal agents in a federal building. And um, it was, although some people deny, it was obvious that that was the first trial run, and if it got the death penalty, they, they were done, because you can't really re-prosecute people who are dead. So they didn't both get the death sentence. And so now they're prosecuting Nichols over again for killing state citizens. So the children and other people who were in that building, he's being accused of murdering, and his trial was happening in the state court. So he asked for change of venue. Why? Actually, it was an additional reason. Not just because he thought people wouldn't like him, but because he wanted to be somewhere where they wouldn't kill him. Right? Because in a federal court, they have that ability to give the death sentence. I mean, remember, there were cases in Michigan, I don't know if you remember them, where they happened on federal land, so as a result of that, they were able to do the death penalty. Right? So it doesn't really matter what state you're in the federal court, but once you go into state court, in order to get the death penalty, you have to be in a state that has the death penalty. So the government's fighting hard to keep him somewhere where they can get him the death penalty, he's fighting hard to get somewhere else. So we'll see what happens there. All right. Boy, I used the word dead a lot, didn't I? Dead, dead, killed, dead. All right. Uh, standing to sue. This means you have to be the person that was injured, harmed, your interest was affected, not someone else. Okay. So I may hear that you have a really sad story, I feel bad for you, but you're the one that has to sue, not me. Now, me being an attorney, I could represent you, but I would be representing you and your interests, not my own interests. So the first part of standing is the right person, the person who alleged they were harmed, has to be the one who's in court. The other part of it is that it has to be a real controversy. Okay, to have standing to sue, we're actually arguing about something that happened. So like, let's say I go to McDonald's, which I did this weekend with my two sons, and I uh, got them a toddler toy. Now, um, I look at the toddler toy, I'm like, this is insane. Look at this toddler toy. My kids could swallow this and choke. And so I sue McDonald's. Do I have standing? Well, the first part of it I do. I mean, it's my kid, and I can represent my kid, and if, if it had happened, you know, it would have been their injury. But yeah, you're right. The second part's the missing part. I can't sue because of something that might have happened, that could happen at some point in the future. Courts have to be deciding real cases, not just hypotheticals that might occur. All right, here's kind of what the um, court systems look at both federal and at the state level. Don't pay too much attention to Texas. Not too many good things came from there. Anybody from Texas? All right. Um, like, they got really weird court names. Look down at the bottom, it says the Justice Court. That sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? Texas Justice. Right. But um, don't pay attention to the names. The names can be confusing. In some, co in some states, like New York, their low court is called a Superior Court. It make a lot of sense to me, but that's how they do it. But understand, in every court system, there's a... There's a trial court level. Then there's this uh, appellate court level. And then there's the highest court. Okay. And earlier we were talking about when cases can jump over to here. Not all the time, right? Only if it involves some federal question or diversity. Otherwise, it stops here. The buck stops at uh, the Texas Supreme Court or whatever the state may be. So, I'm just a little bit confused. When it says Supreme Court under the Texas area, yes. is that the same as the U.S. Supreme Court? No, the Texas Supreme that's the Texas Supreme Court. So, does Texas have any connection with the federal courts? They're totally separate systems. Okay. 
So like if you sued for a purely state-related issue, you would be in the Texas state court system. And that's where you'd stay. And the highest you could go is the Texas, uh, Texas Supreme Court. Most states call their highest court the Supreme Court, but not every state. Michigan's highest court is called the Michigan Supreme Court. So that's Texas and that's every other state. No, that's Texas. That's a, any state. You know, don't, don't even pay attention to the word Texas. I mean, pretend this says Michigan, okay. right? It would be the Michigan Supreme Court, and this would be purely state. Over here is the Fed, okay? And the only way we're going to cross that line there is if it involves some federal question or diversity. It kind of looks that way on the diagram, but um, I guess in turn, I mean, sometimes people think, Michigan Supreme Court, and then higher to that, the U.S. Supreme Court. But actually what we learned about the Constitution is the Constitution gave specific governments to federal government, or specific powers of federal government, and everything else went to the states. So the states have a lot of power. And the U.S. Supreme Court does not have any, any say in a case that should not go outside the Texas Supreme Court. So if it's a purely state issue and the Texas Supreme Court decides it, that's it. It's not like they're the boss of the Texas Supreme Court and get to tell them, yeah, we don't like the job you did today. Let's redo that. A lot of people have a hard time with that because it just seems like they should be the next one in, in line. And they are if it involves federal question or diversity. But other than that, the, Supreme Court, or the Constitution doesn't give them jurisdiction to hear those state court cases. All right, so a trial. You know, I have to write all this down. It's just kind of the process a trial goes through. Um, when it says up there that there's a record, don't get an idea that every case is recorded, and then there's a record of it. Like you get a parking ticket, speeding ticket, a lot of small claims, there's not any formal record of it. And a lot of people don't understand that, but and is not always consistent within the courts. But more important cases, more formal cases, are actually reported and recorded. They start with an opening and closing. Juries are selected, which we learn in your chapter is called voir dire. Um, evidence is presented. Witnesses are examined and cross-examined. If it's a jury, it's called a verdict. If it's a judge, it's called a judgment. Now, in your book, there's a complaint. What page is that on? Eighty-eight. So when you look on page eighty-eight, I think the complaint is green. Not really. I've never seen a green complaint in my life, but I guess it stands out. So looking at that complaint, plaintiff, Lisa, Lisa Marconi, I always want to say macaroni, versus Kevin Anderson, the defendant. The first thing that Lisa says through her attorney is what? Think about what we've been talking about before she launches into her complaint about all that he did wrong to her, she's got to establish what? Jurisdiction. Judge, I'm about to complain to you, and I want you to know before I do, you're the right judge to complain to. Okay? So the first one, the jurisdiction of this court is based on Section 86 of the California Civil Code, which is a statute, is her attempt to establish what kind of jurisdiction? Mm, nope. Subject matter. Remember on that slide where it talked about statutes creating subject matter jurisdiction? So if, we, if the judge wanted to, the judge could go look at that statute and say, oh yeah, these, this is the kind of case I'm supposed to decide. Now the second one is what kind of jurisdiction? Jurisdiction over... Huh? Does it look like it? Oh. Oh. Keep forgetting that. Driving? 
driving jurisdiction? What kind of jurisdiction did we talk about? The court had to have two kinds. Subject matter, Subject matter and person. the person, right? And so which is this? Number two is the person, right? I'm, maybe I, I'm just asking a really obvious question, but it says the plaintiff is a resident of California, right? So the court needs to know that. And, oh, by the way, judge, the defendant is a resident of California, too. That's personal jurisdiction. We're within your geographic boundaries, judge. You can decide this case. And then she goes on to complain that she was minding her own business on Rodeo Drive. And all of a sudden, nasty Kevin came along, ran into her. He was really negligent. And as a result of that, she suffered $10,000 in medical bills, lost wages, and needs her car fixed, right? Now, she, on top of this, attaches a summons is the next thing down up there. The summons says, hey you, you're being sued. You got so many days to answer, file a motion, or get to court. Okay. Now thinking back about what we talked about last class, this is that notice, hey you're being sued, you better do something about it. All right, the defendant can file an answer, and this is how defendant's answer could read. Judge, I'm the defendant, and I admit that this statute says you're the one that decides it. And it could at this point say, but I don't even live in California. I don't know who this crazy lady is. Right? That would be a motion to dismiss, right? Oh, you got the wrong guy. You know, I'm, Kevin Anderson seems like a fairly common name. Right? Uh, let's say that gets thrown out. It's the right Kevin Anderson. Right? Then he goes on and says, on September 10th, 2005, I was minding my own business. This gal was driving down Rodeo Drive, not paying any attention, ran into me. And as a result, I got all these bad things that happened to me. So I want you to pay me. Right? So that would be the defendant's answer. Now, after that, there could be a pretrial motion. The pretrial motion could say, Judge, even if you give the plaintiff everything, uh, agree with all the facts, we admit all the facts, I still didn't do anything wrong, right? Probably not in this case, but that could be one of the things that could be argued. Or judge, you don't need to have a long trial. You can look at the facts. You can decide this. It's just a single issue of law that has to be decided. That doesn't work, all right? So now we're at discovery. Discovery is finding out what evidence the other side has. So what kind of things does Lisa want to know? The plaintiff, what does she want to know about the defendant? Driving records, maybe, is that the kind of thing? Sure, I mean, think about it. You're suing someone that ran into you. What kind of things would you want to know about them? Insurance. Right, what, in, do they have insurance? What kind of insurance do they have? Was there an effect on that date? How, much, how many assets do they have? What's their driving record? Um, what witnesses do you intend to call at trial? I mean, there's all kinds of questions you would want to know before you go to trial. Same thing with the other party, right? Have, do you run around doing this all the time? Um, what's your driving record? Were you drunk? Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of things you're going to want to know. What witnesses are you going? So you go through all this. Uh, you might even have interrogatories, which are written questions that are under oath that you would ask the other side, admit that you didn't stop at the stop sign. Uh, it could be oral, which would be a deposition. Come in, sit down under oath, and we're going to ask you some questions. Right? So then later when you're at trial, you've kind of locked them into what they're going to say. I mean, you know on TV where they always show the surprise witness coming in, da da da, you know, and they've got all the answers and no one knew anything about them? I mean, I think it's malpractice for an attorney not to bother to ask the other side what evidence they're going to present at trial. I mean, wouldn't you at least want to know what witnesses were coming in? So in a lot of cases these days, courts enter pretrial orders that say, you have to tell the other side who all your witnesses are. And if you don't do it by this date, then you can't use them at trial. So that's more the reality of how things work. Okay? 
pretrial conference, uh, they say it so you can try to um, iron out the details before trial. Uh, really, it's just a big pressure job for the judge to try to get you to settle the case so the judge can do something else that day. But anyway. Uh, jury selection. Why do we want to select a jury? Right? Aren't they already selected for us? What do we... What's the big deal? We don't biases. Right. What kind of biases might they have? Oh, Right. They can know the parties. Um, there's a big thing. I was listening to the radio this morning about um, Judge Alito and another federal judge having decided cases about mutual funds that they owned an interest in. Um, there's all kinds of things that if you don't really analyze them, you may later find out someone, you know, had an interest in. Anybody ever been called to jury duty? Did you serve? No. No. It was a big, huge case that they couldn't get a jury to sit on. Oh. It was just not too long ago. I think it was in the end day trial. Oh, no wonder no one wanted to sit on it. Yeah. I kind of got a ticket to get off the jury. I mean... Anybody ask me to serve? I get, I've gotten picked a couple times to be on a jury, but once I explain um, my background, no one wants me. Which is kind of sad. I'd kind of like to be on a jury. Although I've heard lots of jury discussions. Little known fact, as you walk through the courthouse, you, you can hear things through walls. It's amazing what, how juries come to decisions. All right, so the trial, opening argument, plaintiff presents their case first. Why? Because they have the burden, right? Whether it's a criminal or civil case. Right now we're primarily talking about civil case. They have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that they're right. And if they do that, they're going to win, so to speak. Then a defendant can go... Closing arguments, we talked about verdict, judgment. Some, sometimes there's a motion that says, judge, the jury reached a decision, but they must have been sleeping the whole trial, right? Or they don't understand the law at all, okay? So judge, I want you to set aside what the jury decided because it's just wrong. Sometimes that happens. Yeah, it happens on law and order, right? Remember the McDonald's coffee case? Right? In that case, at some point, the judge stepped in and said the punitive damages that were awarded were excessive and reduced it, which a lot of times that ticks juries off when they have to spend 10 days or whatever, and they think about it really hard, and they come up with what they think is a good decision, and then someone says, judge, they didn't know what they're doing, and the judge sets apart the, aside the verdict or reduces it. All right, so we get through all of that and then possibly start an appeal. And I'm going to skip these. We talked about the Supreme Court. Um, let's go to alternative dispute resolution. All right, this is not the trial. This is an alternative to the trial. In some courts... In Michigan, he, they force you to go through mediation. Like the district court here in Grand Rapids, before you can get all the way through to the trial, they assign everybody to a mediation process. Right? And during those processes, if you don't resolve the case and you end up losing at trial, sometimes you have to pay the fees for the other side. So there's a big effort to try to steer a lot of these cases over to mediation to free up um, the docket for trials. So, what are some different types of alternative dispute resolution? The book mentions a bunch of them, but the three major ones you should focus on are there at the bottom. Negotiation, mediation, arbitration. Anybody ever negotiated before? Never? You've never negotiated? I negotiate every day. My kids, my wife. What? I was, like, I was just trying to figure out if you were talking about the context of like, law or just everything. Whether, whether it was a formal legal negotiation. What? It, it pretty much means the same thing. So 
You and another party try to work things out without involving anyone else. That's negotiation. So in this setting, you know, you, you might go to trial, but before you go to trial, you and the other party decide to work things out without bringing someone else in. Um, mediation. Mediation involves bringing in that neutral third party, okay? trying to settle that dispute before it goes to trial. Arbitration, well, let me, let me write this up here. Mediation, non-binding. Arbitration, binding. Okay. That's the big difference. So both mediation and arbitration involve a neutral third party. The big difference being, if you get a result in mediation, you could say, ah, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, do that. I want to go forward to trial. Arbitration, binding, you are stuck with the decision that the arbitrator meets unless it violates the law, the Constitution, or something. Uh, let me leave you on this note. As you enter into contracts, insurance contract, credit card contracts, other contracts, you would be surprised how many of them have arbitration provisions in them. Start taking a look at it. And it'll say, you know, look at some of the contracts you're already in. And they say, uh, if you have a dispute about an accident that you have in your car with us, your insurance company, you agree to go get it arbitrated and not take it to court. Okay. Uh, I'll see you next time or I won't. All right?